Okay, so here we are. It's the last dance, and we want it, we want to make it last a long time, and we want it to be very slow. I know the feeling after a after an ASPO conference. It's that you know you, you just want to hang on because you've learned so much incredible information, and it's been you've bonded with people you never thought you bond you would bond with before. It's kind of this. It's a weird thing between, you know, you've got the granola people and you've got the suits and you've got industry and the vegetarians and, and the economists and the geologists and they're all talking to each other. Don't you wish that Republicans and Democrats could talk to each other like that? But we bonded over this incredible issue. <laughs> and it is actually kind of what gave me hope four years ago when I was running for re-election. It kind of gave me hope that here's an issue that we can all get behind. Uh, thanks to Matt Simmons and his book, actually. Um, but it's just an incredible uh, energy that comes out of this conference, and I hope that every one of you will take, you know, come up with one idea that you take home and you spread this, this energy and this energy message. Uh, now, I know there's an awful lot of, uh, of um, information that has been shared with you, and it reminds me of a story, and I, I hope you all haven't heard it. I hope there's at least one laugh about the... the, the the, the, um, the storm, you know, the storm and this farmer goes to church and he's the only one that shows up and, and the preacher just says, well, you, you made the effort to show up and I'm going to preach the sermon of my life and he preaches and, and it's just, a, you know, an hour long sermon and, uh, and afterwards the, the, the preacher says, well, how did you like it? And he says, well, you know, when I, when I have to go down and feed my, my cows, I load up the back of my truck and I drive down there and if only one cow shows up, I don't feed her the whole load. <laughs> um, so, well, thank you. That was nice of you to laugh. <laughs> and, uh, but this is where you feel like you got fed the whole load. So tonight we're going to try to make it a nice slow dance, and, uh, and we have uh, a number of speakers up here. It's going to be hard to corral these guys. There's a lot of testosterone up here. Uh, but I'm going to see if my little remaining estrogen can overcome. Um, at the far end, we have um, Terry Backer, who is the uh, state rep from, uh, from Connecticut. I almost said Colorado. Uh, and then next to him is uh, Rick Schechter, and Rick in his former life was a futures and options trader, and that's how he lost his hair. And then, uh, and then we have Shell Alaclet, who is the, the president of ASPO USA. He's the one that concerns me the most up here. I'm sorry, ASPO International. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I gave you a promotion. <laughs> uh, and he's also, I know he also is a professor at some school over there, I think in Sweden. <laughs> and then let's see, and then we have Rob Rapier, uh, who I've always been a fan of on the oil drum, and yes, I, the oil drum is, is uh, I'm in love with the oil drum. Um, and then we have uh, Jim Hansen, who's another uh, investment realm, one of those economist types. And then we have, uh, we have Michael Weber, who, uh, full disclosure here, is my nephew. And then, <laughs> then we have Tom Whipple, another great guy, because every morning at 6 a.m. West Coast time, I've got the peak oil news and the peak oil review, if it's that day, is in my mailbox, and I love him for that. It's the very first thing I turn on, my, put my, lap, I, my laptop's next to my bed. Flip open the top every single morning, peak oil news first, oil drum second. <laughs> <laughs> and now you know way too much about me. Uh, okay, so first we have a couple of softball. Oh, wait a minute. There's, am I supposed to read this too? Or is that already taken care of? Okay. Um, and Steve's my backup here because I was amazed he trusted me to do this. <laughs> uh, I still have training wheels. Um, okay, so he's given me a couple of softball questions. I'm not going to let these guys go one down the other answering every question. Um, we're going to direct our question to a particular person. Unless I see somebody rise out of their chair, uh, they're not going to actually get a chance to, to answer. And they, can, and they can, oh, obviously the audience can write questions. And the, hopefully some of those blue-shirted folks are still here, and, or we'll send Steve out. Randy was supposed to be here to help me, but I guess he went swimming with his clothes on. Uh, okay, uh, the first question is for Tom. What will it take for the Washington Post to spend more time covering peak oil? I'm, I'm rather pessimistic about this myself. We've taken a couple of shots at them. I'm going to go back and try to work on them some more. But I suspect 
they're really not going to address this seriously until we get shortages, this sort of thing. You're going to see either much higher prices. They were stirred a little bit this last uh, summer when oil got to 147. And for the first time, they mentioned it. They wrote a three-part series and mentioned it. Unfortunately, it took them three weeks to write the three-part series. And by the time they got the thing published, oil was back down to 110 <laughs> or something. <laughs> so OK. And that sort of thing. But no, I, I suspect we're no hecklers. I suspect we're not going to we're not going to really see too much until until they uh, we start seeing shortages. At which point there'll be such a you know, political outrage running on out there. Uh, it's about two cents worth. Okay, uh, Terry. Will the National Council of State Legislators carry the article you propose to write on peak oil, and where is that? Um, it's still in the back of my mind. I think they will carry it. I've written on energy before for them in a 2003 publication on energy shortages and supply. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, in the middle of an election year, so I don't have time to write it, but they will carry it. And, Cry me a river. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, <laughs> Mayor Cook, I'm unopposed in November. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless, yeah. yes, they've made a commitment to do it. I just need to get off my butt and finish it. Okay. Uh, Jim and Rick, how direct is the connection between the financial chaos we're seeing and the energy story? Go. I, I think that the, the biggest thing with the, the, the energy story that we saw, that from my perception, is that because of the leverage nature of the fuel market or the oil market, and it doesn't take as much money to move that around as people think, the risk that the market took was a lot of those guys were trying to make up for losses they'd incurred, so they were shooting the moon. A lot of them were short at the wrong time, then they ended up going long at the wrong time. And um, you add that to the risks, and then they finally bailed. Um, I, I put a, a graph up in the presentation I gave the first, not, or the first day showing that 30% swings in the oil market are totally normal, and that's all we've seen. It's a totally normal movement. And so don't fixate, and my point I would make again then is don't fixate on short-term price swings unless that's the market you've decided to function in. And I don't function there myself, so I can't comment to that. But I just see a 30% swing in oil, that's a normal move. I have a comment to make. I think the uh, catastrophic events in the financial markets that we've witnessed over the past several weeks uh, is a portent of things to come, uh, given the economic dislocations that uh, resource scarcity is going to bring. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the message uh, that we can send to the non-believers is that, um, that this is just a taste of what's to come, so we need to do something now. Okay, for Shell. This is my first ASPO conference. The information and conclusions and potential consequences seem very logical and almost inescapable. I need to examine the views of anti-peak oil peak folks and organizations to really feel that I have done my homework. How do I get a great summary of the opposing view? Well, you mean summary of the conference. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, here as uh, a representative of the International ASPO, and of course uh, the things uh, that I would feel is that, uh, as always when I'm in the U.S., that there is potential for big movements, uh, and, and the question is how to get the movement starting. Uh, another thing is that uh, very much that has been discussed is also uh, concentrated on the United States. And there is a world outside the U.S. that is uh, as important uh, and maybe even more important than 95 percent of the global population living outside the United States. But, uh, and and I, I think when it comes to economic uh, drivers and so on, what we see now in Asia is so strong and so powerful. And uh, I think that many Americans are not aware of that. And that should also be put into the uh, discussions about the future effects of peak oil in the U.S. It's not just the shortage of resources. It's the fact that things are moving to Asia in another way that you're not thinking about. 
I was just recently in China, and I will just mention that I was had discussions with Sinopec, that is uh, the largest refinery company in China and the third largest company in, in the world. And uh, uh, the, the directors there just uh, told me that they are building a new refinery in China now. It's a venture uh, project, and 50% and of the capital comes from Sinopec, and 25% comes from Sardo Aranko and 25% from ExxonMobil. And uh, I asked, uh, how about the oil to this refinery? Well, Saudi Aramco will guarantee it, so say. So, so, so uh, it's, I was kind of surprised that ExxonMobil was into the deal to take away oil from the United States, but I guess that's what we'll find in the future. Thank you. Uh, Robert, when do you think we might reach 100,000 barrels a day of non-ethanol from corn biofuels? A hundred thousand barrels a day. That's a that's a that's a long time. That's a long time out. Um, I'm not, I'm not optimistic. What is that a year? Yeah, that's 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 uh, that's an awful lot. I mean, uh, you know, you go beyond you go beyond corn ethanol, and uh, you know we we make a fair amount of biodiesel as well. Uh, but not nearly in those volumes, and you step down from that, and there's essentially nothing. Um, there's, there, there is some very small amounts of cellulosic ethanol being made, uh, various uh, research labs around the world. Um, and as I, as, I, as I told Tom all ago, if you subsidize, if you, if you subsidize this enough, you can make cellulosic ethanol. I mean, we will, uh, you know, if, it, if we're mandated to make 36 billion gallons a year and you throw enough money at the problem, you, you can make 36 billion gallons a year. But I guarantee you, you will throw more energy into that than you'll get back out of it. But uh, I'm, and short answer, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that we'll get there. I, I think we'll end up uh, probably with electric cars before we ever get to, uh, to, to that much non-corn ethanol. Uh, uh, Michael, I didn't get my question asked uh, when you had your panel, and so I was hoping um, on a lighter note, maybe you would share with the audience what Evelyn's solution is to this energy crisis. Okay, Evelyn's my daughter. She's now nine. Uh, a year ago when she was eight, she actually gives me a lot of good energy advice. She made a comment as we're driving to one of her soccer games, which is 30 miles away, it seems like. And she says, and we talk about energy a lot. She's very attuned to these issues. I think as most kids are, most kids are actually more savvy than a lot of the adults. She says, Daddy, if we keep all driving our cars, we can run out of gas. And that'll be great, because then we'll have to ride bicycles everywhere, right? And I thought this was sort of a very positive view of what could happen. And Randy, you'd all mentioned earlier that maybe this is a blessing. And it made me realize that for some people, this is a good thing. Uh, from her view, being trapped in a car doesn't sound like much fun. And so we think about peak oil, that means peak traffic and peak congestion and peak rush hours and things like that, right? So there might be some good outcomes from this. And we think of all these social ills where we complain about divided neighborhoods and people don't talk to each other anymore and obesity is the number one public health problem behind asthma. And so if we think we'll have to walk and ride bikes, maybe we'll be healthier and a lot of these problems we can fix will be closer to our neighbors. So she's got a very positive view and I think that's sort of, sort of interesting thing to think about. We tend to approach this as a doom and gloom outcome is the only possible manifestation of peak oil, but there might be some very good things as well. Okay, I don't, I, this is probably not directly for someone up here. I'm not sure they're the ones that propagated this, but um, let me see, I think Shell, can we, it says, can we please start to treat climate change and peak oil solutions with the same brush and not be so divisive? Can we, yeah. yeah. I guess the, really the I'm question is, uh, do you, yeah. how, how do you treat, yeah. Yeah. Do, do you, uh, I, but I mean, the, personally, I think uh, peak oil must be uh, ahead of climate change because uh, in time scale, we are talking about something that will happen in the near time. Uh, when it comes to climate uh, change, uh, this is something that will happen, uh, they're talking about uh, 50 years or something more like that. And uh, before that, we will have people affected by peak oil much, much more. We're talking about survivals of uh, millions or billions of people in reality when we're talking about peak oil. And uh, uh, some of the climate change issues uh, is that, well, one or another city will be uh, flooded, but I mean, the people will have time to move before that. 
think, I think uh, another response is comment noted. <laughs> um, Tom, how many, how many representatives and senators have caught on to peak oil? How many in the peak oil caucus in the House? Any outstanding people? I don't think it's making much progress up at the, uh, there at all. Uh, I do go up there occasionally and talk to people on Capitol Hill. I think the caucus is about the formal caucus, which is only in the House right now, has something in the order of 10 or 12 members. And my understanding is they hardly ever meet, if they've ever, if they've ever met at all. And so they basically, basically the whole peak oil effort in the House is sort of a one-man band up there. We also know who that is. I just don't see too much happening over in the Senate. I've made a couple of, you know, on behalf of ASPA, I've made a couple of runs at senators. I've got to talk to a couple people who are, you know, may, may turn out to be senators one of these days. Uh, I really will not say I've had very good luck trying to talk to them. I had an appointment with one. Uh, unfortunately, what they're mainly interested in there is evidence that the speculators are running the market. That was the kick a couple months ago. And uh, as long as I couldn't provide evidence and support for the thesis that uh, uh, high oil prices were all run by speculators, I don't think they're really inter particularly interested in talking to you. So uh, I just think we've got to see some you know, more major changes out there, probably shortages or something, before people can get, you know, people in general or Congress will get more excited about this. Jim and Rick, is it worth saving General Motors to get the Volt produced? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> I, I think that's more of a political question than an investment question, uh, but because it's all about saving jobs. Uh, I'm sure there are other, uh, other automobile manufacturers who can do it better and faster and more efficiently and probably at less cost, um, but um, there's, uh, there's a, a whole other side of the coin, and that's the issue of uh, trying to reestablish ourselves uh, in manufacturing, because as the GDP starts to shrink and the percentage of the financial uh, markets that w w begins to shrink dramatically, uh, then we've got to replace that GDP with real manufacturing capabilities. And, uh, and so I think in the short term, we may have to support the, uh, the effort to keep the manufacturing facilities going and the jobs here so that we can come out of this catastrophe that I mentioned before without the financial markets dri driving all of the uh, GDP that it's been doing for the last 10 years. Just remember, I, I guess I'd make the comment that being from Seattle, I can say this, you never buy Microsoft version 1.0 and so I'm going to suggest that if you're offered an opportunity to buy a Volt on version 1.0. Oh, anyway. Terry, the big question for me is how can we urge intelligent, planned action prior to the doo-doo actually hitting the fan? <laughs> I, uh, some of you may have sat in on the session I did on the first day. And um, you have to... If you want intelligent action, then you have to present this problem in language that legislators understand. Uh, I use the example, if you want to walk in and tell them the Mayan calendar says the world ends in 2012, they're going to say, well, thank you for that. And, you know, is there anything else on your mind and please leave. If you, if you want intelligent responses from legislators, you need to speak their language and you need to talk to them about something that they're all mostly keenly aware. And I would say, number one, give up on Washington. Start working on your states, start working on your communities, start working on the people who you bump in, into in restaurants and in stores, not the people you see once or twice a year. So um, what's important to me? I've been uh, in almost every position in the legislature in 18 years, and uh, for a long time I was the uh, vice chairman of appropriations. I handled about $18 billion. And what I understood about my obligation was how money was spent and the impacts of how money was spent. So if you come in and, and, and you want to talk to about how I sold peak oil in my own legislature was to talk about economic impact and how it relates to the duties of a legislator to the people that they represent, to the future of those people. I expressed some concern 
about GD, state GDP falling, unemployment, tax, tax revenue failure, uh, the impact on housing. Uh, state is, all states, pretty much in the United States anyways, house a lot of people. We call them prisons. And they have to be heated and they have to be fed to look at which road will we not maintain as tax revenues drop because of demand destruction on oil. So I tried to lay out the impact, the economic impact, and the obligation to the state to serve its population and the explosive growth in social services that would follow a contraction in our service economy, which would be hit first. So I got their attention with that by saying, whether you, whether you uh, understand peak oil or you do not understand peak oil, what you understand is an escalating trend in the increased cost. You get supply disruptions because you've witnessed hurricanes and so forth. I think we've got 40 rigs in the Gulf missing still after the last hurricane. Uh, the older ones. So I, I think they, that's how you approach it. If you want them to respond and you want them to delve into your issue, you need to approach them with, I have concerns about you accomplishing your commitment to this community, which is to, to, to protect it. And most of them see that as an economic response. And if they feel the economy of the state is at, in, is, is at threat, I think they respond by saying, tell me more. And once you get tell me more, you have, you, you've opened the door. And so, I mean, the, the, yeah, I'm sorry, I think it's already hit the fan, but, uh, uh, you know, my obligation is uh, uh, to keep going uh, as long as possible to soften the impact on the people I represent. You know, I, I like those people. Michelle, I can <laughs> tell you're elevating yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I would can tell you that uh, I've been quite successful in Sweden uh, and uh, promote the peak oil uh, story, so to speak. Uh, and uh, one important part in doing this is to work with industry. And so I'm concentrating on talking with industry leaders first, because politicians, yes, uh, they can see that they have some impacts on uh, life, peak oil, and so on. But industry leaders, they realize that this is reality. If we are doing things wrong, we will lose business. And, and uh, for instance, uh, I've been so successful, so uh, the Swedish company Volvo Trucks, uh, now officially as the first automotive company in the world, says officially that peak oil is one of three driving lines for our future production, for instance. And, and uh, uh, I can also tell you a story about uh, the automotive industry. Uh, you know, Chrysler and Mercedes-Benz was uh, once one company. And at that time, the guys in Germany called me and uh, they said, uh, we here in uh, Stuttgart, we think there is a problem with future oil production uh, and uh, we are relying on Sarah now. And uh, because that is what Chrysler is saying that we should do. But uh, we like to have you uh, into the business and uh, see if what you come up with. And, uh, and then uh, it was quiet for some time and I, I called back and said, how come about this project that you like to do uh, with us and Sarah? And uh, they didn't say so much. But later on I heard on the other way around, some other, don't tell me how, but I said that, that Chrysler has forbidden Mercedes to discuss with me about peak oil because today it relied on Sarah. And you know, you know what's happened with Chrysler, I guess, and you know what's happened with Mercedes, and uh, I, I think which one is the better off. Michael, are there any concrete commitments for demand for CTL from the Department of Defense? Yeah, there are concrete commitments, but they might be null avoid because of the Congressional Section 526 mm -hmm. in the Energy Independent Security Act. So the Department of Defense basically said if someone can deliver it, they'll buy it. And the purchase order is out, the request for bids is in, the people are, the Department of Defense is just waiting for it. But then this Section 526 was inserted requiring or prohibiting the Air Force or anyone else in the federal agencies from making those kind of purchases unless they can prove the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions are lower than conventional gasoline. So the purchase order is on the street, but it's invalid. Department of Defense is serious that it's trying to figure out how to do these benchmarks before they can execute the purchase order. Now, just because they have the desire to purchase doesn't mean they have a provider yet. So there's, there's an invalidation by Congress, and then there isn't a provider yet anyway. So there's two holdups right now. The desire is strong, though. Steve has a question for himself. <laughs> Actually, it's not a question for myself. It seems that I would be the appropriate person to answer this. Uh, and there are two of them on the same thing, so I thought, hey, I'd uh, 
take a crack at it. Has anyone asked Al Gore if he'd be willing to carry the peak oil message? He seems to have some clout. Um, and then someone else said uh, Terry Backer spoke in the, uh, at the state and local government sessions about finding a champion. As an ASPO newcomer, I feel ASPO needs very public figures on the national and international level. Agreed. Does ASPO have any outreach to recruit those people? Uh, Peak Oil needs an Al Gore. It's interesting that Al Gore was, was the, the person chosen, and, and I think for obvious reasons. Uh, just to give you a little quickie here, there, um, in July of uh, 2006, President Clinton was quoted on an uh, uh, extensive, uh, uh, I think it was Atlantic radio interview about peak oil, and then has since spoken about it some, but that's one that was on the record. Um, the month prior to that, I was at a uh, retreat with a couple of dozen people, and Al Gore was one of those individuals. And um, I gave a 15-minute wrap on peak oil uh, one of those evenings. In fact, if Richard Heinberg is here, the reason I was at that meeting was because it was in my backyard, and he referred uh, them to me. I appreciated that opportunity. Um, that's the kind of synergy and, and work together we need to do more of, by the way. Um, at any rate, uh, I made a small presentation. Uh, I have a, a two-page data set on, that tells the peak oil story. Uh, we publish it in the, uh, every June. Uh, it's based on the BP data. And I handed that out. Uh, uh, I had literally one copy. This is impromptu. And he came up afterwards and said, nice data set, as a geek, true geek who would, would do it. Um, then, uh, but he was on Larry King Live the following week. I mean, this was the week that Inconvenient Truth, two or three weeks after Inconvenient Truth had hit the theaters and the bookstores. And uh, 40, 58 minutes of that session uh, on, on Larry King Live was on the, the climate change story. But he was pitched the question at the end, so anything else on your mind? And he mentioned peak oil. And he, not only did he mention, but he talked about a number of serious geologists who take this position, uh, who've been at it a long time. So I thought I would at least share that, that there are some folks who are, have been at the top uh, have, have mentioned this. But the, going to the point uh, uh, of these questions here, who, if you marry the peak oil and climate change questions that closely together, and Maury Wolfson on our board has, has pointed this out, there's a tendency, if for those who reject the climate change story, and there's a percentage who do, uh, it isn't a huge number. I think Terry's nodding because this is, this is something we talked about uh, when he was writing his report. Um, if you marry those two uh, very closely, you may find that those who ha have a resistance to the one story automatically build in a resistance to the other story. It doesn't mean that they don't uh, work together at some level. It means that you need to be careful how you frame the story. To that end, we do need, though, and, and this is a really good point, we do need some high-profile figures who would be willing to step in front of the mic, a la who killed the electric car. Uh, we need something that gets that kind of circulation uh, to, to break on through. Um, and so I would encourage the collective wisdom of the room to not just write us questions on this, but write some suggestions as to who we could get and how we could approach them. You know, we tried to approach Matt Damon. Uh, didn't work, but maybe we ought to go back to it. Those Syriana clips and the goodwill hunting are as good as it gets, at least in, in modern times. So just sowing that seed with you, taking your own question and giving it back to you. Thanks for the question. I don't think anybody can do it better than our own Madison. Another heckler. Um, and, you know, and also along those, uh, we had a couple of cards here about uh, the climate energy uh, intersection and this, what seems to be this division um, of, among ASPO. Uh, I just want to mention that ASPO doesn't have a position on, on climate. Uh, you know, we have nine board members and everybody has their own position on what they think the best tactic is going forward. I think um, in many respects, the comments, and I don't want to speak for Randy, but I think his comments represent this uh, pragmatism. Hey, since he is in such a political family, he recognizes that, uh, that, that you know, when, when push comes to shove, he knows what politicians do. 
Uh, you, we saw it down with the hurricanes. The first thing they did was ask for a waiver from uh, the air quality rules so they could import fuel from you know, Canada or wherever. Uh, that's just the way politicians are. So I think it's that, it's, a lot of this is that recognition and I've certainly experienced that myself. Uh, not a lot of courage there. Uh, let's see, for Rob, uh, is U.S. produced biodiesel better than, worse than, or equal to corn ethanol in terms of its benefits? The, uh, the, the life cycle analysis uh, that I've seen show that biodiesel has a better energy return. Um, I think even, even David Pimentel, who's pretty pessimistic over, uh, over corn ethanol, um, if you look at the analyses he did, he came up with biodiesel as being better than, than corn ethanol. Um, I think he still came up with it being close, close to one. I think he came in uh, with, with corn ethanol at something like a 0.7 or something, um, which I think is a little bit too pessimistic. Um, but if you, if you separate out the, uh, the oil production piece, the oil production piece for soybeans was, uh, was well over one. I, I think it was uh, two or three. Um, and then he made some pretty pessimistic assumptions on converting the, the soybean oil into, uh, into biodiesel from there. Um, there, there are some other processes, and uh, I went upstairs during the break, and I wrote a, I, I wrote a quick blog um, article. <laughs> yeah, to, today, um, you know, ConocoPhillips, who I used to work for, we announced a deal a couple of years ago with Tyson Foods. We were going to take uh, their animal fat, and we were going to hydrocrack it. And this is the green diesel that I'm talking about. And it's distinct from biodiesel because the, the byproducts from green diesel it, or the byproduct is propane. The byproduct from biodiesel, which takes an alcohol like methanol to make, is glycerin. And biodiesel, as I said earlier today, has very inferior cold weather properties where it, gel, it will gel up. And you put biodiesel in a, in a tank in Minnesota in the winter and, and it'll freeze solid in your tank. And so uh, there are several companies around the world that are actually doing green diesel. I mean, they're, they're taking, uh, I mean, you can take soybean oil, you can take animal fats, and you can hydrocrack this in a refinery, and you can make a true petroleum diesel. Um, yeah, they announced today that this is, this is what I was talking about about games politicians play and, and, and trying to pick technology winners. They specifically excluded uh, that credit. They said, you know, we're going to favor the guys who are using food to make biodiesel. We're going to give them a dollar a gallon credit. They said, Conical Phillips and Tyson, we're not going to give you that dollar a gallon credit. We're going to exclude you specifically from that. So you need to compete with these guys without the subsidy. We're going to give those guys a buck, and you're getting nothing. And that's some, also some of the animosity toward the oil companies, because one of the guys said, I'm not subsidizing oil companies. Well, Conical Phillips came back and said, it's, it doesn't pay out to do it otherwise. I mean, if, with a $40, gallon, $40 a, gal a barrel subsidy, which is what a dollar a gallon is, it pays out. I mean, it, it makes sense to do it. But, you know, if you, if you deny us the subsidy, we're not going to compete with these biodiesel guys who are getting a dollar a gallon, uh, a, a gallon subsidy. I know that's a, a rant away from, uh, but uh, I saw that news today. It was very topical over, over what I talked about this morning about politicians picking technology winners. This is another reason I prefer just raising fossil fuel taxes, because you don't get into this mess. Those guys all have to compete on equal footing, and you, you level the playing field then for, for all the alternative alternate fuels. Boy, I love that accent. Can I have one, can I have one comment? Yes. Sure. I have an accent. Yeah. <laughs> I think everybody else sounds funny. You you're, sound you're normal. From, you're from New York, right? <laughs> one, one other benefit of biodiesel is that it works in standard pipelines. And so what you do the energy balance for the production, but then there's the energy balance for distribution. And it works much better to move biodiesel in pipelines compared with ethanol, which you move by truck. Because the trucks are not energy efficient comparatively and they tear up the roads, which take asphalt a lot of effort as well. So that's one advantage of biodiesel. There are all the other advantages you mentioned as well. But because they're compatible with the pipelines, you don't need special anti-corrosive new pipelines like you would for ethanol. Biodiesel has some advantages. Well, there's also the combustion efficiency. The combustion yeah, efficiency of diesel and a diesel engine is a lot better. So your, your, your power to your wheels, if you're, if you're doing biodiesel versus ethanol, is, is a lot better. You know, once you've met these oil drum guys in person, 
when you, you it, it takes on a completely different flavor when you read their remarks. So now every time I read you, I'm going to be hearing the, that southern accent. <laughs> it, it, make, it makes the comments very different. Uh, okay, Rick and Jim. How, Rick and Jim. Uh, how long do you think oil will continue to be traded on a futures exchange? I'm, I'm going to say, first of all, I do not involve myself in the futures exchange, it, it, to, other than to the extent that if I can buy it cheap in the ground, that's fine. But Rick, you, you're, that's your bailiwick. It will continue to be traded on an exchange. It's a question as to which exchange, uh, but only until the day that we begin rationing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Tom, we've had a, a number of comments here about the framing of the message and that, uh, you know, peak oil needs to be sexy or, you know, it's such a doomed message that people don't want to hear it. Would you like to care to comment a little bit about how we could maybe frame this so that it's more palatable? That, that's a good, I'm not sure how we make any of the results of peak oil particularly palatable to people. Yeah, make it sexy. Uh, I, the major problem is if you, if you think through peak oil to a couple levels of what, what's going to happen here, it becomes you know, definitely a very unpleasant message very quickly. And I think that's, that's some of the problem with it, and that's sort of what uh, I think that's mainly why no politician really wants to handle the question. So far, we've got absolutely nobody, you know, much stature in the whole political world, is ready to go out there. Jimmy Carter was the last one to want to do it, and look what happened to him, yeah. and that sort of thing. So it's, that's, it's a message as simple as that. You know, I just don't think I can offer much of this thing to how to make this a particularly pleasant topic. I think it's going to sort of bounce along the way it is now. I'm fairly well convinced the current financial crisis, you know, depending on how it plays out, could bury peak oil for the wall. For the, I think for the time being, it's totally you know, ridiculous to take a run at any politician or something. They've got so many other problems right now you know, that may be on their heads over the next 24, 48 hours or the next two you know, days or weeks that something that may be a couple of years away from now is an eternity. So uh, I know it's not a very satisfactory answer, but I'm afraid I just don't have any, you know, anything good to say about well, it. Well, I think Rick wants to chime in on that. Uh, I, I, I hate to have a race between the climate change and the peak oil group uh, because it's not the type of race that we should be running. I think that it needs to be reframed into a, an issue of energy security uh, because it all comes down to the security of your supply, whether you make an issue of the supply impacting the environment or the supply impacting your lifestyle in a carbon constrained world. But we need to reframe this in an issue to, to, to identify the uh, issue of energy security and all the ramifications that means. And of course the mitigation options uh, will serve both camps, uh, but in order to get the message across, it's one of energy security. And, and, and the other issue I wanted to make about a point earlier, uh, asking a, a figurehead to lead the charge, whether it's a politician or a celebrity, uh, whenever you have a, a point taken and there's data that someone else can refute the message, you're, it's very unlikely that certainly not a politician will come up and, and refute the data of our own government uh, in the USGS in terms of reserves or the projections in the EIA. So until and unless we can change the data set, and I, and I think that can be done politically, but until and unless we can change the data set and take away that weapon of the opposition to point to this government data and, and refute what you're saying in terms of peak oil or whatever, uh, that's the mission. You know, I, I don't want to turn into a free-for-all, but I think it's important because I labored over that. Uh, when I drafted a bill, I had to come up with a name for it. And I labored over it, and I said, you know, uh, Armageddon, death and destruction. What I came up with was an act concerning energy scarcity and security. And people don't like scarcity, and they do like security, and it put a different tone to the debate on the floor. And I think how you frame it is very, very important. And we want people to understand how important this is, but you know, if they say, hey, we've got 20 minutes to live, you know, someone pour me a drink. You know? Well, you know, an interesting thing, I was talking to someone who um, knows I'm a peakster, 
And uh, he said, the problem with peak oil is that it implies we need to find more. And I thought it was a really interesting observation. When I hear criticism from people about the way I'm framing something, I take it very seriously and try to, and, you know, try to think of it from their perspective because uh, you know, we have to go to people where they are, not where we are. Uh, Shell, yes. what about the IEA report due out in November? What impact will that have? Well, the impact of the report, if it's really saying, as they say now, that uh, we will not reach the numbers uh, in production, will have a big impact. Uh, just uh, mention the number 100 million barrels per day as it is too high, but if that number is mentioned, uh, I think uh, that will have a big impact. Uh, taking the fact that we, something was mentioned about the, this earlier uh, indicate that it might even be lower numbers uh, because they had to take it in steps. Uh, so they have taken one step now and there might be a second step. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they will put down the production of oil in 2030 to the 80, 90 million barrels per day range. And with that number, uh, it's a completely different game when it comes to uh, economy. And uh, every, every agency has, uh, or government has to think about it, especially in Europe. And I mean, it's, it's absolutely clear now that when uh, politicians try to come together and make decisions about one thing, uh, uh, they cannot argue about uh, these numbers. I mean, they say, okay, we take the numbers from the agency because uh, we don't need to discuss that. There's many other things that we have to discuss on the line down, so it's very important that that number will be come down and be real. Well, I'm just disappointed they couldn't come out with this before the election. Uh, here's one. That, uh, are you willing to approach Michael Moore? <laughs> uh, uh, after the election. <laughs> Keep him outside this. Yes. Um, let's see, I got so many questions here. Uh, Michael, what are your suggestions for individual and household energy reduction strategies? I tend to focus for individuals and small businesses on water use. You can save energy faster by saving water than most other approaches, and you could start with solar or hot water. That's actually much more cost effective. It's much better way to reduce carbon, much better way to reduce energy, to use solar hot water than solar panels by far per dollar per square foot per photon. So that's a great way to start going towards water efficient devices, dishwashers and laundry as well, d doing less laundry and fewer dishes. Water is a big part of our energy consumption overall on the residential side. The other side is food preservation through refrigeration and freezing as a next step. We all have a refrigerator and then we all have a freezer. Seems like where do we put that freezer? in the hot garage where it works hotter. And so we have a lot of these programs to encourage you with rebates to get a more energy efficient refrigerator. So we do, and then we put the non-energy efficient refrigerator in the hot garage where it's working <laughs> twice as hard. So there, there are a lot of simple things we can do just on food and water that will save a lot of energy. And then you can work on thermostats and light bulbs, things like that later. Uh, one thing we do in Texas that's bad is we tend to have big houses that we air condition and then we have the lights on during the day so the air conditioning has to fight the light bulbs. In the Northeast, the light bulbs are actually useful because they heat the house for you in the winter, so they're different things. But I would focus on water first, food second. And you're having the vasectomy on which day, did you say? Which, I, say, <laughs> I didn't mean to talk about the Yeah. <laughs> and limit the number of kids you have. This is uh, Aunt Debbie giving me good advice. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to pay for that one. Uh, uh, yes, Shell. I'd like to go back to one of the, the, the seminars we had this afternoon about uh, how we, the habits we have, how to move. You know, uh, they, uh, the research shows that on average we are making 3.8 longer moves per day in general. And uh, uh, when I start to discuss this with people and I say, well, when they ask me, what should I do? I say, think over your four moves per day and uh, how you can make these uh, shorter. And uh, because uh, uh, that's very easy. And, and uh, but uh, I, I think that is a very, very good way to save energy, how should I make four moves per day that is shorter and more energy efficient than I do t uh, today, I mean tomorrow at the end of the day. And I think that's a good way to start and it's easy for people to think over that part also. 
Well, the way our city did it was uh, we audited our electricity bills and saved 100,000 in, in false charges and <laughs> locations that we didn't, uh, that we didn't, didn't belong to us. Okay. Um, Jim, do you think Mexico's decline will be the event that causes awareness to increase? If not, what? And please, I think it says please be specific. <laughs> okay, who has the x-ray vision out there? I just passed that note to Tom. Um, those of you that spoke to me during the last couple of days know that this is a big hot button with me because the immediate crisis of oil, the United States can go into the global market and compensate for the oil decline coming out of Mexico. We'll be able to use those somewhat less worth, or somewhat more worthless dollars, anyway, um, to buy oil. The problem is going to come when Mexico, and if those of you that follow Jeff Rubin know that he has predicted a, a net export to zero point for Mexico in 2013. My looking at it, I think it's to 2012, maybe a little earlier. And at that point, the federal government of Mexico has no revenue from oil, and it's 40% of their revenue at this point. Um, given the cultural, social, and economic impact of that kind of a catastrophe across our southern border, we'll have implications way before maybe we have an issue with scarcity of oil or prices with oil. Um, I think that that, when I bring that up to politicians, my experience is in, I now have their attention because of the nature of the immigration issue and the pressures, and it starts to go, well, if what we're getting now, and you're telling me this could happen, and I say, well, you know, if I'm off by two years, does it matter? And so I think that that's the, the catastrophe, and, and I realize that there's obviously ways to play that from an investment standpoint, and that it's kind of the Grim Reaper approach to making money, um, but from a personal level and from a cultural level and the implications of the United States, I think that that might be the event, and we will see a currency crisis more than likely before the actual point of zero exports. And given the window of 2012, 2013, we may not be very far away. So I would suggest if you, look for, if you really look for something to, to maybe pay attention to other than the actual flow of oil, that's where I would look. And that may be the button you can use with your, your political leaders, particularly at the national level. So that's my observation on that. Okay. Um, Rob, since you're an oil drum guy, I know you can answer this one. You guys know everything. Uh, given the low levels of finished product stocks in the U.S. gasoline <coughs> over recent periods, what is your time frame for shortages? Or do you believe that we will have rationing by price? I mean, yeah, we're having rationing by price right now. We're having shortages in the southeast. Um, I, I, I do think we'll claw our way out of this. I mean, I don't think this is a permanent situation. But I think this is a situation we'll see again and again. Um, especially at, the, at these high prices, re refiners, uh, they, they try to run their inventories low. You know, they don't want to have a lot of money tied up in those inventories. So, uh, you know, especially if you, if you pay attention to inventories, and this is something I talked about in my, in my talk on Sunday, you knew we were sitting in a very precarious position as the, uh, as the hurricanes came rolling in. Uh, because we, we were going into uh, the end of hurricane season here, sitting on record low inventories. And uh, if, you, if you're an inventory watcher like I am, I watch inventories every week. When the hurricanes moved in, I said, you know, it's not going to be long before we do have shortages. And there were some stories on the oil drum. Uh, Gail wrote a story about the, the potential for shortages. And sure enough, uh, when the hurricane came in, shut down refineries, very quickly you saw, you saw gas stations running out of gas. Um, okay, we're, I don't want to go too, too far over because um, the music is starting to slow down here. Um, this one actually was for me has to do with non-energy related uh, things you can do like not eating meat and limiting the birth rate. Um, I say it's not, it's for me because I am a vegetarian and people never ask me why I'm a vegetarian, but the reason is because of environmental concerns, not because um, I have an issue about people eating meat. Uh, but you'll notice that today at lunch there was no meat on your plate, and yes, we are aware, and I always lobby for that, but after eight years um, serving on this one agency in Los Angeles, they still can't get it. I still show up and they don't have something for vegetarians. So it is, it's frustrating for, and I only have one child. Um, figured out what caused that. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, see? <laughs> and I'm running for what? Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, let's see, what's a good one here? Michael. At ASPO 6 in Cork, uh, Professor, I think it was Professor Ping, I couldn't understand him though, if anybody was here, heard, <laughs> from China Petroleum University in Beijing said, they were unlikely to go forward with CTL because of not having enough coal. We have lots of coal, but wouldn't burning it for electricity for plug-in hybrids be a better choice? That's a good question. Actually, China, I think, has announced the last few weeks that they're going to build some coal to liquids plants. So I'm not sure they're not going to do CTL. In fact, it might make more sense for China in many respects because their, their prospects for domestic oil production are getting better but don't have huge upside. So I wouldn't be surprised if China goes in a large way towards coal to liquids. Uh, the short answer, though, is coal for fuels versus coal for electricity. Which one's better? Coal for electricity is better, I think, in the end for a lot of reasons. Uh, the simple answer is it's much easier to control the environmental impacts and emissions of 1,500 smokestacks and 300 million tailpipes. So there's a big environmental benefit from focusing on the power plants. And then from a carbon emitted per mile traveled basis, electricity is still better despite the cost of lithium ion batteries and everything else. So we, we find significant benefits. Then you have air quality benefits, all these others. So in the end, coal is better for electricity than for fuels for that mobile transportation. I actually have a paper we just submitted that looks at the air quality benefits of plug-in hybrids in the northeast of the U.S. And we find that uh, for ozone, which is a big concern, we have all these cities in non-attainment, which means they exceed some ozone thresholds and are at risk of losing billions of dollars of highway money because of pollution, which leads to asthma and all sorts of problems. It's really advantageous to shift the pollution from tailpipes during the daylight to smokestacks at night. This temporal shift in the emissions from the tailpipes to the smokestacks, even for dirty coal, still gives you an air quality benefit because you need the photons to make photochemical smog. And so there's a huge benefit for shifting your, your emissions from the daytime when we're breathing it to the nighttime in the rural areas when we're not. That paper's in review right now, but there, there might be significant air quality benefits from using dirty coal to power electric cars. So there are a lot of reasons why I think coal for electricity will make more sense than coal to liquids. Problem okay. is aviation, you can't fly on a battery. Okay, we, I'm gonna do two, I'm gonna do two. Or electric cord plugged in. Sorry. <laughs> I'm glad somebody got it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, okay, that. we're going to do two last questions, and each one of you will get a chance to answer it, and it's going to have to be obviously very brief. Okay, this one should be really, really brief. Um, this is, please guess what year oil might reach $200 and $300 a barrel. Start down with Terry. I have no idea. <laughs> That's a good answer. Rick? Uh, 2011. For, for wait, wait, two, there's 200 and 300. So 20, the the date. Okay. Okay. You said 2009? Same. 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 2011. 2011. <laughs> the, uh, the day the Chinese are willing to pay $200 per barrel. <laughs> or 300. Because they are setting the price in the future. Because they have the money that they make by selling things to the United States. I think 2011, 2012 for $200, and it won't be uh, maybe a year later, and we'll see $300. Jim? If you're assuming a permanent price there, not, not an event spike, then, then I have to go with that 2012 number. Yeah. I'm just a dumb engineer, so I'm going to go on a limb and say if the dollar keeps plummeting, we could have it this year or next, right? Because it's a function of the dollar strength as well, and the dollar is not constant over time, so it could be here next year. Don't, don't quote me on that. I wouldn't have asked based on my advice. Are you tenured? Yeah, no, I'm not tenured. <laughs> <laughs> well, well it went up $25 yesterday. We could have four more days like that. that. So. A few minutes. Yeah. If, if one assumes the Chinese are really setting the price for this sort of thing, they just may be slowing down here for a while. They announced some slowdowns this morning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they were very optimistic. They're going to keep this 10 or 11% growth rate whizzing along because they're so big. It really didn't depend on selling things to Walmart as much as we'd like to think. But uh, we're starting to get signs that they are slowing down. And uh, this depends on where the whole world financial crisis is. This may take a while to get there. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, now, no dissertations here. But how do we better harness, this is for everyone. 
including the politician at the end of the table. How do we better harness the intellect, energy, and commitment at this conference? And what would you give us one suggestion that you would tell your an elected official when you get home about the peak oil problem and what to do about it? So how do we harness the intellect, energy, and commitment that's here at this conference? And then what would you tell uh, an elected official in your community about peak oil and what to do about it? Well, I mean, I certainly don't need to go back and tell them I've been telling them for two years. Uh, and what I've been telling them that it's a threat uh, to, to the, the public safety and the welfare of the people. I mean, in, in, this, in the shortest possible terms, that's what my obligation is. Harnessing the energy here would be, um, you know, I don't know how many different places you all came from, but if there's 500 of you, then there's 500 places you're going to go back to. If you want to harness that energy, then you need to form, and probably many of you already do, but we need, it needs to grow, is uh, you need to create a lot of little dots that coalesce into bigger dots that can then take the uh, citizens' grassroots lobbying effort to the legislature. When you walk in and you talk to your local representative and say, I want to talk to you about peak oil, they go up and they sit down with their colleagues in the caucus. Anyone know anything about peak oil? No? Okay. So you're going to need a greater, um, uh, a greater mass of, of lobbying efforts to do this. You know, in Congress you can go in, I guess you get to the right guy and you can get money for a bridge. But uh, on this type of stuff in the legislature, on the, when you're asking us to, when you're asking them to change the world as they know it, that the things their kids that are learning in college may no longer matter that they've just spent 60 grand on, then I think you're asking a big thing. So you're going to need to create a critical mass of people who are going in and saying, we have a threat to the public safety and welfare. We have an issue that's going to affect our economy. And you need to grow those dots. I mean, I said this, and I know you wanted this short, so I'm going to say, I said it in the thing. Stop your choir practice. Talking to each other is choir practice. And so those of you who are not talking to decision makers in, in a calculated, strategic fashion, you're, you're, you're involved in choir practice. That's it. Yeah. Again, I think it's important to, uh, to, to phrase things properly and to use the right vocabulary so that you're not creating uh, the, the opportunity for someone to block the message. So I think sticking with the idea of, uh, of energy security, um, but I think really what I would do is I would, I would target uh, people involved in politics, uh, politicians and their advisors, with the message that uh, I'm concerned about energy security and I'm, I'm concerned about whether or not we have the proper data to plan ahead. And everyone has to do some planning if you're a politician, whether it's uh, where to spend your money or where, where to raise your money. Um, so you need to suggest that we have enough political pressure at all levels to convince the federal government to look at the USGS data and to say whether or not this is a valid data set that we can base our, our projections and our lives going forward in an, in an era of uh, increased geopolitical threats to our energy security. Everybody likes to feel secure, and if you stick with that message, uh, point them in the right direction to increase the security by determining a real data set as to what we have access to, what we expect to use uh, on a going forward basis, whether it's a, you know, a same story or, or whether there's a best case or a worst case projections, but we need to change the data sets. Okay, now you um, remember the, your date's father is expecting his, his daughter back real soon, so we got to shorten it up just a little bit. Well, um, I should probably do the same thing as I did at the ESPE conference in Paris. I said, uh, people in general are interested in drinking. So I, I would say that, okay, I have 10 bottles of champagne here, and one of these bottles contains 100 billion barrels of oil. And uh, this is all we have in the refrigerator just now. And uh, pull up the glasses. I mean, one year is uh, one th third of the bottle, so that three glasses is one bottle. And, people understand, well, well, okay, if I had 10 bottles to drink and if, if finish one bottle in three years, it's very easy to understand that we have a problem very soon. And uh, I think that's an effective way to get people to understand it. Yeah. Talk about drinking and not the uh, <laughs> using of
First of all, if you haven't talked to your family, and most of you talk to your families, talk to your family. I've talked to my immediate family, of course, and uh, I talked to my extended family. Uh, a couple of Christmases ago, I gathered them all together and I said, we have a serious problem, and I, I want them to understand that I'm not crazy. So uh, I, I, I explain the situation. Um, you can't sit next to me on an airplane and not hear the message. And I, I, I'm very careful in the words that I use. And I'll say, some people believe, okay, and uh, here's why they believe that. And, uh, and, and I'll get the message out in that way. I, I, don't, I don't give them a doomer message. I will tell them some people think that this may be the consequences. And here's why they think that. And it gets their attention. And I've had very few times that I wasn't successful in uh, the person who sat next to me on the plane. They got off the plane. I, I was confident they understood the problem. They were going to go. They were going to read. They were going to talk to people about it. So just commit to, uh, you know, as you travel home, as you travel around, um, it's very easy to bring up the subject, uh, you know, you can talk about gas prices. What do you think about these gas prices? Why are, why are they high, you know? Uh, well, you know, they're, they're high because uh, oil production's flat and, uh, and it's going to deplete at some point and get the conversation going that way. I, I completely concur on that. Um, my wife gets sick and tired of going to a party with me anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> because after a while, I have a group of people. You know, I just you do that. You bring up, hey, what do you think of these gas? And all of a sudden, and then be, and be careful, because this is a, not an easy topic, and it takes time. Um, I, I found a little success by actually hitching my wagon to the climate change model. Um, I became a strong defender of the program of climate change at the University of Washington, got my foot in the door. Um, was able to make presentations there. So I've actually used climate change as bait. Hopefully they're not all going to... To get the message on. And to people who I could have normally not gotten to. And uh, I, you know, maybe that's a, a tool that you can use. It works for me, and it's worked well, um, and, and even with the political level. That, that gets me in the door. And then I can give them a slow dose and move from there. So I'm sort of old school. I still believe in publications and the power of the pen. Easy for me to say as a professor, uh, papers are my currency. Well, I'll give a sort of example to explain this. So I, I guess I fully believe in this idea of doing a publications or proceedings of ASPO, and so I support what Alex Dessler is trying to do with getting some journal. A presentation lasts as long as the room, right, the people in the room here. A publication can reach a broader audience. One example is I've spent the last two years, including into speeches, lectures, seminars, and talks I give, the value of manure in the U.S. as a potential source of renewable energy. We've got enough manure in the U.S. to offset 1% of our energy needs, about 2.5% of our electricity needs, and it's actually a pretty good resource in many ways. And uh, no one ever cared. I wrote a paper that was just published about two months ago saying the same thing, and it was peer-reviewed scientific journal paper, and it got picked up and became an international media sensation where I was interviewed on BBC, NPR, ABC, CBS. It was on ABC Nightly News across the nation. And it was downloaded 2,000 times in three weeks, a scientific paper. So I think the power of publication is actually a pretty, pretty good way for you to reach a broader audience, much more so than presentations or speaking. So I think this idea of proceedings of publications could be quite effective for you. And Michael, we've always known you were full of manure. I'm full of BS. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah, I, knew. I set myself up yeah. for it. I, I think my message is urgency. This is a lot closer than most people think. I think the whole world realizes there's some sort of problem out there with energy. I think our message here is what we really specialize in is understanding the details and that you know, we understand things like world oil production has not really significantly increased or been flat for the last three or four years. We understand peak exports. We watch Mexico, this sort of thing. And I think we realize that very, very soon, it's months, I won't tell you how many months, there's going to be real serious problems. And that's my message. And I'm going to give it my final shot here to kind of wrap things up. Um, over the last eight years, I've attended eight leadership uh, symposiums. You'd think I would have learned after one, but took eight. And the most valuable information I ever got from a leadership program was that relationships are primary and everything else is derivative. Uh, it, you know, basically that means that it's that relationship you have that, tr that changes people's minds. A, a stranger isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to give you the time of day. But go in to meet an elected official with somebody that he or she knows, and all of a sudden, everything changes, and all of a sudden, they have an open mind. Um, and it's a good lesson for all of us not to burn bridges, because uh, you know, they may not agree with you on this issue, but maybe another one will come along, and they will, uh, they'll be your friend. Uh, it's the most important lesson I've ever learned. 
And uh, so, now, so now the uh, music has ended, and it's uh, kind of a sad time for me to have to say goodbye to my peak oil friends and all these wonderful new relationships that I've formed. But I know that I will be able to tap into them, tap into them either through the ASPO organization, uh, through the, the oil drum. Uh, all of these people I have found to be incredibly open and willing to help anybody that needs help. I, you can have my email address. I know that everybody here is probably very willing to, to share whatever they can with you to help you uh, uh, making this transition easier. So I appreciate that all, what all of the panel members have done, these as well as all that we've heard in the last two and a half days, and I appreciate so much of the participation and this willing, willingness to take a risk with us because the wonderful thing about ASPO is we're willing to take risks with speakers, with issues. We know that it's not going to please everybody, but we're going to try it and, uh, and learn from that. And, uh, and we appreciate that all of you have uh, stuck it out and, uh, and done that with us. It was a wonderful journey. So thank you very much, and I hope to, um, I hope to meet all of you again soon. <laughs>